So to begin, can you please um, introduce yourself and describe what you do? I am Pedro Reyes. I am an artist. To describe what I do, I may need a more specific question. <laughs> your work, um, your work is very political, and something I wondered uh, just on the first instance of seeing your work was whether you ever thought about becoming a, a politician rather than an artist. <clears throat> well. Um, that is very curious that you ask so because uh, that that you know I I I have that's like a kind of secret temptation that I wish uh, you know eventually I would like to have a position as mayor or uh, of a small city or something like that uh, but it's just a desire because often I think that what can be achieved within art is only reaches a small amount of people and I'm interested in producing change and uh, I somehow feel also that I don't like I mean we all complain about the world and how the world like the government is run etc so I don't feel the the right to complain if an, any of us is willing to do something and, but I don't know, it's also very scary. So I, have, I still have to decide where there. I, I, one day I will try to, to do it. But, uh, I mean, at least for now, I try to use art to produce change on several contexts. Not always. I also do a lot of art that is just uh, art for art's sake, and I enjoy very much doing it. And I don't believe that art has to produce change necessarily, but you cannot, you should not deny that possibility if the opportunity arises. I think it's so interesting that you talked about the, the reach of art, um, because the material you use in a lot of your work is, um, based in this tradition of art pauvre, right? It's the, it's materials that are not necessarily considered high, high, high art, you know, um, whether it's guns being turned into, instruments or guns being turned into shovels that are then installed in a minimalist way on, on the wall. Could you just talk about why you choose those materials? Well, I mean, turning weapons into something else is very basic operation of changing the polarity of something that was meant to kill and now produces life. So uh, I believe that if there's this potential for transforming matter, not like taking the substance, the metal that, uh, that, you know, was designed to, uh, to kill and then, uh, now can produce, like, you know, be a tool for planting a tree or an instrument for making music. That, that material transformation also can lead to a psychological transformation and hopefully uh, to a social transformation. And, uh, in that way, you know, uh, also tools and instruments are something that are activated and that always lead to a new piece that is not longer my work, but something that is a, the work becomes an agent in the world where it's being used by other people. And I'm working now with a lot of musicians that are using my instruments, but they are doing a uh, new artwork, which is these musical pieces. Uh, so, so long as it's reproducing, it's alive. Um, and, uh, and also the, the fact is that, you know, often we see in culture guns and, 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 and weapons are featured in video games and Hollywood movies, etc., as something sexy and, and something cool. And I believe that there, that we need to, 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 change that perception uh, because it's the perfect cliffhanger and it's a kind of a very easy resource uh, but I believe that has to do with the fact that we have inherited a brain architecture from apes and uh, same as we get excited with sex we get excited with violence uh, because you know violence was something that was necessary for our survival. So that's, you know, like the, the, the fact that so many movies end up with a half hour of a car chase or this kind of, uh, 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 situations 
have to do with this brain architecture that we that that is kind of very primitive so uh we all need to have certain spaces of violence but i believe that we should be able to transfer or need for for, for for violence instead of 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 having violence against other people then transform the, like le like transfer that into objects so you know like sculpture or or dance or or you know like a, a smashing a guitar into pieces or, or any other cathartic actions that we could have instead of killing each other could be an interesting outlet for that uh, instinct is there um for you a fear of making the work you know is there a fear of of breaking down an object that could have killed someone a fear of of, of 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 making of actually you know whenever i've held a gun i've it's frightened me so i was thinking about the way in which you make these works is there a fear implicit in in breaking something so violent apart uh no no it's it's actually uh overcoming uh, you know uh, i mean it's interesting to uh, that you know, I, I believe that the moment I get the, the guns, you know, they've been the, the kind of uh, rendered useless as guns. So they're in a net neutral phase and then I have to move up into uh, the positive side, which is making them sound. So, you know, uh, you cut a barrel of a rifle or uh, something in different lengths and they produce a different sound or you drill a hole and then you can turn it into a flute, etc. So already the process is much more like trying to 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 redeem this metal from the former function that it had and uh and uh, it's like you know it's like the story of George and Dragon no mm -hmm. it's uh, you have a uh, uh, i think about this story because for instance imagine that you know George has to rescue the princess that is in a tower and there's this dra dragon that is trying to keep like uh, uh, protecting the tower from anyone rescuing the princess. So if if George would come back holding the dragon, you know, in his hands, like, hey, hey, I killed the dragon. So like, no, you fool. What we wanted was the princess. You know, it's, uh, you know the, the idea is that you can dwell in the problem and, you know, like, a, a, which is often what is, what, what is basically the exercise of criticism, you know, like you explain, you do a longer elaboration of, of why things don't work. But actually, to bring the princess, uh, although that's kind of a corny metaphor, uh, but is to just like, I mean, you deal with the dragon, but in the end, what you have to do is to, to bring what is the, the, the ultimate positive thing. So you, it's not about like saying why things don't work is how, it's like saying how could they work or, and, or making them that like, like this to become into something else. Uh, and this, that's a kind of operation which is, uh, common to this, this kind of project. No, you, you have to, 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 to turn something negative into to so, something positive. It's a kind of very, very simple, uh, a dogma that I in, in, kind of uh, embraced. It, it might be simple, but, um, y you know, y you go to seriously dangerous places, you know, where disappearing women is a normal thing, where gang violence is. So there, there must be a, a, a there's danger in that, but there's also a, a bravery in, in that. Um, well, I mean, I, I think that there are much m many other people who really uh, uh you know like put their lives uh, in serious risk you know for instance journalists and people who really have uh, to uh you know like provide names etc who uh who are real heroes you know I don't think that I am in uh, I, I could claim such a a um to 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 put myself into those situations of risk, uh, there's people who are really uh, taking risks. Uh, I don't. I I I am quite 
you know, there's many people that are in between so the, 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 you know, and help me that, uh, that, so, you know, I wouldn't claim to, to be any kind of hero at all. Can we talk then, um, a little bit about your, your audience and how, you know, y your work sits within a history of art of, um, Boltansky and Bertrand Lavier, where the, where the viewer becomes the work's performer as well as its observer. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about your audience and? Well, I, I mean, um, for instance, projects like the one that opened this week, Sanatorium, uh, it's precisely the participants that bring the narrative into the project. And also, you know, I have, for instance, for this project, a group of therapies that I run by volunteers. And for me, it's very important to have projects that can be conducted by people who have no credentials whatsoever, you know, by, by non-professionals. Because I believe that if something is useful, then it should be widely avail available and that, uh, uh, and also, you know, I think, I believe that it's important to create platforms where people can help each other, uh, in this exchange, which is not based on any kind of a transaction, uh, like money, etc. So, um, I mean, there's many sources of inspiration. One of them was a psychologist called Enrique Pichon Riviera in Argentina that had a situation where the, there was a strike in the hospital and there were no nurses and no doctors, etc. So he had to come up with a system that is called grupos operativos. So people that were sick in the hospital were taking care of themselves. Um, you know, it was a kind of psychiatric hospital. And, uh, and, or for instance, Paulo Freire also developed a method of education that where the group was, you know, it was all about tools that show the resource, resourcefulness of the group. And these things that have been, uh, case studies in psychology or, or pedagogy or, uh, or uh, liberation movements have been uh, elements that I, uh, took into the exhibition space. Um, and there's this very playful element where you ha experience moments that are extremely intimate. Uh, but with total strangers, no? You, you enter a game, so it's very effortless that you open up and talk about your innermost, uh, concerns, uh, with people that otherwise you would only be talking about the weather. So it's all about going straight into the kind of, uh, most, uh, intimate issues, uh, with total strangers. It's a kind of a structure that allows you to do that. It, it feels, um, it echoes against what uh, Marina Abramovich tries to do in some of her work, and, and specifically with the new institute she's building, right, where there's the space for strangers to have a moment of of pause and reflection. Do you, do you see that parallel? I mean, the I think that I I I I, I respect and admire her work a lot, but I believe that it's quite the opposite what I'm trying to do, because for instance. I mean, she, she's, a, it's, I mean, a lot of times about her own presence. Uh, and, uh, and mine is precisely the opposite, which is, you know, uh, I'm not needed. And, uh, uh, and it's all about, uh, it's the protagonist is a procedure, not, not any specific person. Uh, so, so, I, w I mean, what I'm interested is in just taking elements that is a, is a process that anybody can conduct and that anybody can, uh, uh, enjoy and, 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 uh, like be, it and so they're useful for everyone, uh, without, you know, it, for me, like the idea that there has to be like a kind of a 
that there is a, a, speci a special, I mean, I don't believe in the kind of fetish of, of, of one particular personality or one particular, uh, 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 also, you know, like the idea that, that, that you can, that you must get help from a shaman or a priest or a doctor. I am against this idea of someone who has a special power. Uh, it, it, uh, what I'm trying to do is something that is extremely democratic and autonomous uh, platform that can, anyone can uh, use. But do you, do you ever then worry that, you know, sanatorium, the people working there don't have credentials um, and they don't ac actually have to subscribe to a code of ethics either? You know, doctors, lawyers, therapists l legally are obliged to do right by their patients. Do you, do you worry about um, the, yeah, well, your power and the, the power of the people you're putting in there and whether that could be abused? No, because you know, like all the all the all the the design of the therapies is kind of uh, quite harmless, uh, and also, uh, I mean, there is a, a, a certain rules that are very easy to agree on, and you know, like that have to be about like basic respect for other people, uh, but the. I'm, I'm trying to remember you said something that that I wanted to comment on. Code of ethics, maybe? No, before. No. Uh, uh, they don't have credentials. Doctors and lawyers and therapists have to. They're obliged to do. They're legally obliged to, to behave well. Mm -hmm. Do what's right by their patients, which obviously they don't always do. Yeah. Um, and just I wondered if you... I mean, for worried. instance, the thing is that, for instance, the sources that I am using... Like Milton Erickson, for instance. Milton Erickson was a, a, a psychologist that had a code of ethics, so to, so to speak, where you could only, you had a top, uh, like a, you could only go up to seven times with him. Uh, which was, you know, uh, he says, like, if you want to get cured, you only have six, seven, six or seven sessions. Why? Because, you know, like the way that, that psychoanalysis and other therapies work are, uh, you know, on the side of the therapist, it's like a, he's like a kind of landlord of your, of your problems. Uh, so she's charging you a rent for his time, you know, and the, in the side of the patient, you don't really want to get cured. So you just want to dwell on your issue. So Milton Erickson, for instance, who created short term therapy said that uh, a goal without a deadline is just a dream. And, and, you know, if you want to, if you want to, you know, like produce a change in your life, you have to have a set goal. You know, like a lot of psychoanalysis, psychoanalysts will tell you that, you know, that they don't even believe that, that what they do really changes people. Uh, so, um, I, I have been taking elements from other schools of psychology. Like a lot of elements from psychodrama and, and, uh, 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 other, you know, that was created by Jacob Levy Moreno, um, who, who are very much about, um, staging, uh, situations that are, you know, conflicts that you have in your life and creating a rehearsal space so you can test how that change can come about. You know, like you are placed in a kind of a, with a number of other persons that uh, work as surrogate egos that you can have a conversation with persons that you want to have a, a con kind of conflict resolution technique. And then you, you, this, this rehearsal space was, is called surplus reality, which is not reality and it's not fantasy. It's something that is a kind of extra reality that you can Test and, and make an experiment about the new person that you want to, the, the new change that you want to introduce in your life. And then you test it, you know what is it about, etc. But it's all about being, like, it's about testing the change that you want to bring. And it's already on the side of the solution. So, 
as I said before, is you have to be working with creativity on reinventing yourself rather than explaining why things don't work and trying to work on the past. You have to work on this in-between space in between, in, in the, in the, like between the present and the future where you can test how could life be different. Do you think you have a, a blind optimism and like faith in people? Probably. It's a kind of a personal bias that I have that, uh, that I, 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 I try to all, I mean, like I often think about, uh, that, that the, yeah, I'm very kind of a very hopeful person extremely optimist, a kind of radical optimism. Um and uh yeah, I mean I I mean I I, I could let in, you know, like a lot of doubt and a lot of uh, hesitance. But um I mean I think that there's a lot of that already in the world. So uh just to you yeah I mean, definitely, it's a, it's a kind of a. I, 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 I mean, but I, I mean, like from time to time, I get like, uh, you know, uh, I, I may lose hope, but then I, 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 I like it, I, 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 somehow, I. There's a lot of reasons to, 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 you know, it's, it reminds me. Of uh, it's a long anecdote about John Cage, but uh, you know John Cage. Uh, what some students were telling him, "Hey, Mr. Cage, will you come to the demonstration about the Vietnam War?" And he says, uh, "No, actually, I won't join." And he, they ask him, "Why should I join?" And uh, he says, "Well, because there's already there's a lot of suffering in the world. You sh you know we, we could, you could show your support." He says, "Well, actually, I believe that the amount of suffering there is, we are in the, the kind of the right amount of suffering in the world." And I, I have always like thought, I was asking myself, "What is John Cage trying to say here?" Because it was a kind of very strange answer, no? Uh, that, that, that the amount of suffering that we have is enough or is appropriate. And, um, uh, and then I found in another interview that he, he that it, it was actually like a kind of a half of the statement because then he says that, you know, as much as there's a, a lot of hell and suffering in the world, every day there is a, con it's a kind of constant miracle, no? So you always have a mix of heaven and hell. In Mexico, in particular, it's always a mix of heaven and hell. No? It's a, we're kind of a, a, a lot of uh, drama and a lot of joy. And uh, a, so, yeah. Next question. <laughs> um, I think that you, I mean, you, your work does exactly what you what you just said. It's almost like you you do a project, you make a huge installation, and then you've done it and then come up with another idea where you want to push to, to make a, a change. Um, and I'd love to just talk a little bit about the People's United Nation because um, that as an installation uh, is is really interesting, right? You're, you're putting the um, global problems into the hands of ordinary people. Um, I'd, I'd love to just hear how successful you think that's been yeah um in the united, in the people's united nations or pon uh one of the beauty or you know one of the the nice things that happened was that um the fact of role play uh, the delegates that were appointed, we had to identify 180 delegates for every country that there is in the world. And the first day they came and they were, you know, like nine to six at the Queen's Museum, which is kind of very far. And uh, it was a very cold day. And I believe that no one will, will come the second day. And everybody came back the second day. And I believe that part of the 
of the reason, you know, obviously taking into account that they were, you know, uh, uh, giving their time uh, without any kind of uh, incentive in exchange. Uh, I feel, I, I believe that they were so much in, in character, they were, you know, in so much playing the role of being delegates for their own countries that they felt some kind of responsibility. But also, you know, like, for instance, like in a place like New York or LA or London, etc., you were anyway together all the time with people from every other nation or place around the world. But the fact of being in role, uh, in, in, in this role mod, it created a special dynamic where there was a, a very interesting thing about mutual admiration, but also, you know, a, a certain number or a negotiation between, I mean, you were not dealing with a person, but with a, the, the kind of idea of a nation state. And they were not representing their countries, they were representing just the, their, their nations. But, uh, you know, like the idea of role play is something that interests me a lot because it it puts you in a situation where you experience a different side of human nature that you don't have access every day. So uh, that's why I love games because uh, they bring out uh, something that you don't have access uh, otherwise. And uh, for instance, there's uh, one of the activities where the delegates had to meet up in small groups, like groups of six, and everyone has to confess what's the thing that they're most embarrassed about their own country. And then you have to workshop with the team, you know, uh, imagining that you live in an ideal world when uh, you open the newspaper and then you see that that very thing that was uh, extremely embarrassing has been solved in almost uh, in an extremely positive way uh so it's almost like a hilarious joke and that's and so you know they they workshop and then they come up with these headlines of, of where they have the way they've seen uh their problem solved no so for instance you know if in Turkey, they have the highest numbers of uh, uh, journalists in prison. The the, well, the joke was that the the, the 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 Turkish prison had become like a kind of a journalist mecca, and the Turkish prison time sweeps the Pulitzers. No, or uh, another joke was about uh, you know uh, the Philippines. Uh, and the pers the delegate from the Philippines was very angry about how the Catholic Church was blocking uh reproduction health for women. And uh, so you know he came up he crafted a kind of headline that was uh you know, the Catholic Church joins forces with the government to create free abortion clinics nationwide. And that, you know, they were crafting all these headlines that were these wild wishes for what they wanted for their country. And, uh, and it's because this has to do a little bit with a kind of a theory that I have about jokes. Because jokes, if you analyze a joke, often you have, you know, uh, like the setup and the punchline. And the setup is like a warning that something is going in the wrong direction and the punchline is so far below your expectations. That that kind of uh, differential is, you know, you 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 laugh because it's something that that helps you uh, deal with the trauma. No, laughter is something that that helps you live with that disappointment. So what I'm trying to do is to create these workshops where you have to come up with an extremely optimist punchline, because you know if there's like a kind of a shock value, but that can go in the re in like the opposite direction, then you that may lead to uh, ideas that could have the potential to capture the public, public imagination precisely because how wild they are. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in the, that's one of the many activities that we run. It, when you're designing a space like that, how, how much do you, uh, think about and conceive that, that 
for the formal space to to influence the the people in it um yeah cert certainly space has to do you know like certain spaces allow for specific kind of participation for instance i try to avoid situations like where you have for instance like a group of people sitting towards a point so uh, because that's you know like kind of a you have one active speaker and then all the other persons are most mostly passive no instead uh, you know if you see pe people in a circle then there's not no no clear uh uh, leader and uh, everyone you know can take the lead at, and and then uh, it's in constant in constant flux so spatial arrangements led to different kind of situations no i i i i, I take elements for instance from speed dating where sometimes you have you know like people that are rotating and then meeting uh, with uh, with another or uh or elements from theater a lot of uh, warm up exercises for actors that have to do with staging situations creating a kind of a tableau vivant so i i definitely believe that that sculpture is something that happens in the space and that you can create sculpture just uh, by, uh, by 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 you know like a uh, creating these social situations. And do you think that you apply that to um, the the sound pieces? You know, is there a visual hierarchy in the way that you position the, the drums against uh, the piano? Uh, well, in those, I mean, like those pieces uh, are different because there's, um, um, I me, but in a way that's more like a kind of landscape, no? Where you have yeah. sounds coming from different parts and in a way you walk around them uh, or between them uh you never know exactly where, where the next sound is going to come from so yeah and do you do you really think art can change the world do you really think it'll make a difference well i mean like everything we do changes the world either by action or inaction uh so it's actually you there's no way you have an impact in the world. You always change it any, any, so. But, uh, I mean, also, but if I ask myself what art has changed me, it wasn't art that was intended to do that, no? You know, my, well, perhaps, but for instance, you know, like, there are certain novels and certain movies and certain songs that change my life. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, you never know what is going to produce change in, but I believe that if we should not deny the possibility that art can produce, can, can produce change. Uh, I mean, yes, there's work that, you know, uh, that perhaps is more clearly political, but, uh, but it's not, it doesn't mean that one art is better than the other, no? Uh, although, you know, perhaps one thing that I am interested in is that I believe a lot in art that can be easily understood by everyone. So, because I think that it's important to create new audiences and it's important to, you know, that there's this, this element of communication. And per, and, and, um, and I, I, I mean, for my, I, I, I would hope, for instance, you know, uh, that, you know, perhaps sometimes why I'm so very interested in these elements that, you know, like these kind of therapies or these kind of activities can be conducted by everyone or anyone is that precisely my hope is that they could be, easily replicated and scaled up as almost as public policy no i would i'm trying to persuade mexican government to do kind of uh disarmament campaigns where you know like there's all these workshops that are done across the territory turning weapons into musical instruments 
So if that were to like a, become a, a, a kind of a public program on a na nationwide uh, uh, scale, you know that's that's what I'm working on. That I would that would make me very happy, no? Uh, or for instance, I created a a dish that is a the it's a it's a hamburger that instead of meat has crickets, so it's called the grass whopper. <laughs> and uh, it's it's you know like the idea of okay, what's the most mainstream food. Uh, well, it's, it's a hamburger, no? And, uh, a, so trying to picture what would be the kind of fast food place of the future, which obviously, you know, if we were to eat protein from insects instead of cows, that would create a huge, uh, uh, environmental change. Uh, you know, there's like producing meat is the thing that consumes most water in the world and also creates the most uh, carbon emissions. Uh, but, you know, like turning one pound of grass into one pound of uh, crickets is just like a one-to-one -one ratio. So uh, we would really, we could really solve me, uh, most of our uh, uh, problems with, uh, well, a lot of our problems with global warming by shifting uh, uh, or food habits, and it's a cultural thing. You know, the the the, the resistance that we have towards eating insects is, is cultural. So that's why we believe that actually that's where art can come uh, to help. No, because it's you know as part of culture, you can rebrand certain things that were disgusting and then you know now are delicious. Do you see the the grass whopper as a as a sculpture? Um, well, yeah, I mean, if you have a very kind of a, a expanded notion of sculpture, it is. Uh, but you know, the, what it, I, I mean, like, what I'm, what I'm most interested in is when some ideas that are art or that can are incubated within an art institution, if they have currency, outside the art world and if they have currency without the name art attached to it then they are even better because you know like it means that people get it and they don't need that kind of uh, protection 